Thanks, Jenny. Um, and I would like to present Dr. Stefano Cavada. Um, he completed his PhD at the University of Venice in 2004 and then continued on at the University of Venice as a postdoctoral scientist. He's currently at the Plymouth Marine Laboratory since 2009 and is a senior scientist. Um, he is the internationally recognized leader of the biogeochemical data assimilation team at the Plymouth Marine Lab and the National Center for Earth Observations, having over 20 years experience in developing and using marine ecosystem models, publishing data assimilation systems for ocean color, as well as shelf sea ecosystem models. He has been extensively involved in international panels and working groups including but not limited to co-chair of the Marine Ecosystem Analysis and Prediction Task Team of the Ocean Predict Global Organization, um, chair of the UK NPOP Marine Data Assimilation Working Group, as well as a member of the science team of Ocean Predict, CMEM's Biogeochemical Data Assimilation Working Group, and the IOCCG Ocean Color Modeling Working Group. We are very glad to have Stefano as one of our speakers in anticipation of our session reanalysis of the earth system current and future status at the summer meeting next week and this will be one of several seminars that we have this week organized to inform our discussions at that meeting so without further ado i'd like to turn it over to stefano who will be talking about ocean biogeochemical reanalysis the current status and future perspectives thank you okay so yeah uh, today i will talk about ocean biogeochemical reanalysis giving a little bit an image of what's the current status and also uh, what are the future, future perspectives uh, according to me. The outline of the presentation is, okay, first of all, why are we assimilating biogeochemical data? What data uh, it's good to assimilate in the biogeochemical uh, context? Uh, some issues that we are still encountering in this discipline, which is relatively recent, and then some conclusions and future perspectives. So, uh, first of all, uh, why are we assimilating biogeochemical data into ecosystem model? This is a schematic of an ecosystem model. I'm sure I don't need to go into details what is a, an ecosystem model, just to say that uh, we are representing some key elements of the ocean, including the biogeochemical components, for example, phytoplankton, and how this is connected to the other components of the ocean, including nutrients, zooplankton, uh, dissolved organic matter, fluxes uh, with the atmosphere, and so on. We are linking these uh, biogeochemical models to physical models, uh, which are three-dimensional models and provide transport to the simulated variables, but also provide state variables that are drivers for the biogeochemical dynamics, like, for example, temperature, salinity, and irradiance, which is driving uh, photosynthesis, as you know. Then we have uh, data that we can compare with the outputs of these kind of models, for example, ocean color from satellite, which can provide indication on the biomass of, of phytoplankton through the chlorophyll, or can provide indication of phytoplankton functional types that are the different uh, groups of phytoplankton that compose the whole community. And all these measurements are provided through the signal of remote sensing reflectance, which is what the ocean color uh, satellite, uh, it's what the satellite see. But we have also in situ observations from underwater that we can use to compare with the model outputs. For example, data of chlorophyll, oxygen, nitrogen from gliders, or more recently from biogeochemical Argo floats. These data, we can assimilate them into our models for means of data simulation techniques with the objective of estimating better what is the true status of the ecosystem, which we assume being the between our model simulation and our biogeochemical observations. Data simulation techniques put together these two pieces of information, taking account of the errors and trying to get closer to the true state of the system. These are some recent uh, examples of biogeochemical data simulation systems, which has been reviewed uh, by Fennel and colleagues uh, uh, in the um, uh, Ocean Ops uh, paper in On Frontiers uh, in 2019. And we see that there is a big variety of models and data simulation techniques and data that has 
been assimilating, we are ranging from global models that are assimilating, for example, partial pressure of CO2 and biogeochemical argo flows data, or we have uh, four DVAR methods. Uh, during this presentation, I will not focus that much on the data simulation methods, rather on the data and the outputs. So I would suggest this uh, paper uh, for an overview of the most recent advancements uh, in, the, in this context. But also the IOCCG recent report um, that was on ocean color modeling can be very useful to see the state of the art. Uh, what are the applications? But for example, on the left, we see an operational prediction for the Mediterranean Sea, 10 days in advance of what will be the, it's expected to be the nitrate concentrations at the surface by assimilating chlorophyll data into a model and making a 10 days projection. On the right, we have another kind of example, a reanalysis of oxygen uh, on the Northwest shelf where we identified some areas of oxygen deficiency, risk of oxygen deficiency, providing also margin of uncertainty for this map by assimilating again a, a ocean color data from CCI in a 10, ten years reanalysis. And these kind of outputs are used for aquaculture assessments, for fisheries, uh, for improving monitoring systems, or also uh, for policy uh, for policy uh, objectives. Some example on the global scale here, a paper from Greg and Cecile in 2019, where they assimilated uh, data of uh, chlorophyll from 1998 to 2015 to estimate, to provide a reanalysis of global primary production. And they found that this is uh, has a, 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 a significant declining in the period. And they also reanalyzed uh, it identified uh, some significant trends in other variables uh, that are shown on, on the right uh, of your screen. For example, associated to this decline in global primary production, they found uh, that it was linked to the significant decline of nutrients and on the shallowing of mixed layer depth. And this is just an example uh, of what we can do uh, in the reanalysis by assimilating ocean color. Or another example is this paper by Ford de Basiela in 2017, where they assimilated two different products of ocean color chlorophyll from uh, the European CCI uh, initiative from ESA and uh, the Globe Color dataset to estimate, for example, the trend of ICCO2 flux uh, in the tropical Atlantic. So these are different examples of um, applications of reanalysis of ocean color. So uh, the product uh, which most often is assimilated in, uh, to perform this kind of reanalysis is ocean color total chlorophyll seen by satellite, which has some uh, advantages because it allows us to correct the bulk primary component of the ocean, which is the total primary community uh, phytoplanktonic, and it's useful because they provide global coverage with daily frequency, but have also some um, some adverse effects. We can correct, for example, the total community, but not the different groups of phytoplankton. We can uh, it can refers total chlorophyll to just one component of the ocean, which is phytoplankton, and not other components, for example, color dissolved organic matter, and it refers and can correct most of the time, just uh, what happens at the surface of the ocean. We can address these uh, problems by assimilating, for example, functional types from the ocean, uh, optical data uh, from satellite, or BGC, biogeochemical argo flows data that can see what happening, what's happening in the ocean interior. And so now I will show some example of, three, of these three different types of data uh, assimilation. First, PFT chlorophyll assimilation. So, you know, PFT are uh, the different uh, groups uh, of phytoplankton that have different uh, characteristics and different impact on the biogeochemical cycles, for example, from picoplankton, diatoms, uh, dinoflagellates, and uh, microplankton in this uh, example here. 
And uh, in a publication recently uh, that we produced in the Northeast Atlantic, uh, Bruin identified, uh, produced four time series uh, error characterized of PFT chlorophyll for this region. And we assimilated them into an operational model of the Northeast Atlantic. And here's some example, which is quite interesting. This is a table uh, of skill metrics. We have bias and mean absolute uh, error on the IPS, IPS axis. And here it's interesting because we show that if we assimilate total uh, chlorophyll or PFTs, we have similar errors for the total chlorophyll. But if we assimilate PFTs and we look to the PFTs, we can see that if we assimilate the phytoplankton functional types, we are improving uh, the representation of the phytoplankton community. That means the different functional groups. While if we assimilate total chlorophyll, we can even deteriorate the representation of the different functional groups. Uh, yeah, this is just a repetition of what I said. Again, uh, we are just correcting one of the optical uh, component of the ocean if we assimilate phytoplankton functional types. We can do better, maybe, if we assimilate uh, optical properties, bulk optical properties, for example, diffuse attenuation coefficient, or even remote sensing reflectance, which is what uh, the satellites really see. And this is what has been done by John's and colleagues uh, in 2016, they have been assimilating remote sensing reflectance in a model of the uh, coral barrier out of Australia. So this is a true color image. They assimilated remote sensing reflectance into this model, and we can see different results and compare what happens. First line, data uh, of chlorophyll from, uh, I think, uh, well, I don't know if an Argo floats. And we can see, interestingly, a deep chlorophyll maximum at a, around 100 meters, that the model control uh, is not capable to uh, reproduce. Actually, it's overestimating by large the chlorophyll at the surface. If we assimilate chlorophyll DA, actually, we do not improve the simulation of chlorophyll, but actually the system uh, crashed after a few weeks of simulation, if uh, we assimilate remote sensing reflectance, they managed to reproduce better uh, the chlorophyll and even to get some, uh, some improvements for the underwater, uh, for the deep chlorophyll maximum. So if we assimilate uh, optical data, we can constrain a larger number of biogeochemical variables. Still, Again, it's a satellite data, so we can improve mostly uh, what happens at the surface of the ocean. Maybe we can go do better or we can complement this by assimilating data from gliders and biogeochemical argos. It's what has been done by Cossarini uh, et al. in the Mediterranean Sea. We have here uh, Control is again the model without any assimilation. And we have then the assimilation of data from biogeochemical argos. One of the very first examples actually in the literature. It's, uh, it's something new, this one. And they managed actually uh, to improve the simulation of what happened uh, at the deep chlorophyll maximum uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. Again, uh, they managed uh, also to get some improvements on a variable that they are not assimilating, which is nitrate, and they managed to improve and decrease the error also at uh, in the deep uh, in the deep waters by assimilating uh, the chlorophyll argo data. Again, so the advantage is that we can finally correct what's happening in the uh, interior of the ocean by assimilating biogeochemical algal floats data. But uh, still there are some difficulties in defining the errors of the biogeochemical algal floats data. And again, uh, we have a limited spatial temporal coverage of uh, when we are using this data if compared to the satellite data, which can provide synoptic images of what's going on in the ocean.
So this is a little bit till now what uh, has been done in terms uh, recently in terms of new data simulated uh, into biogeochemical model to provide reanalysis. Now I'll go I will go quite quickly on some technical issue we are still having. Most of the data simulation techniques assume that the distribution of the variables that we are simulating observation that we are simulating it's Gaussian. That means like uh, the bell over there. But we know that nonlinear biogeochemical processes actually cause that uh, the variables of the oceans are not Gaussianly distributed, but have, for example, this kind of log normal distribution. And this makes some methods, data simulation methods, fail. So in data simulation, now we are applying some kind of techniques to improve the distribution of the biogeochemical data so that we can bring them back to the Gaussian distribution. For example, anamorphic transformation proposed by Simone and Bertini in 2009 that allows us to deal with this kind of biogeochemical data. Here an example, but I will go very quick on this. Uh, an Atlantic Ocean model data control, which is the data uh, which the model without any data simulation, we see that we have some bias for chlorophyll, while the nitrate is quite well simulated. If we do data simulation of chlorophyll, we slightly improve the chlorophyll, but we are actually deteriorating strongly nitrate because of this problem of non Gaussianity. If we apply a technique, log transformation, which uh, correct the Gaussian distribution, we manage to improve, Fontana et al. actually, manage to improve uh, the simulation of nitrate. This is just to say, watch out, that when we are simulating some data, biogeochemical data, if we are not careful, we can deteriorate the simulation of other biogeochemical variables, in this case, nitrate, if we do not apply the right technique. I'm not going into detail. There are other methods that we can apply to address this problem of non gaussianity log normal, for DVAR methods or particle filters, but I don't think is this uh, the right moment to talk about that. Uh, just to say another thing, uh, the problem of assimilating physical data into coupled physical biogeochemical models, it's quite a big problem because, for example, here we have a model, data from satellites, control, which is the model without assimilation, and on the right, physical data assimilation, I think altimetry uh, and temperature and salinity profiles. What happened? Okay, when assimilate the physical data, uh, this causes some spurious vertical velocities in the equatorial Pacific. And this causes a deterioration of the simulation of nitrate. So here the key message is, if we assimilate physical data into a couple physical biogeochemical model, we risk sometimes to deteriorate the simulation of nitrate. And this is a current problem, which has not been fixed yet. Uh, some solution, can the assimilation of, phys of biogeochemical data help the simulation of physical variables? Yes. For example, this paper produced by U et al. in 2018 showed in an ideal simulation, a channel, synthetic uh, data, temperature nitrate, and the relationship between temperature and nitrate. They showed that if we were assimilating physical data to correct phytoplankton, uh, uh, sorry, physical data to correct physical data, we were deteriorating the simulation of nitrate because essentially we were deteriorating the vertical relationship between the thermocline and the nutricline. If they were assimilating physical data to correct both physical and biogeochemistry, they were managing to keep this relationship vertical between thermocline and uh, nutricline. Even better, when they were assimilating biogeochemical data, they were managing to improve both physical and biogeochemical simulation and preserve this important vertical relationship between uh, temperature and nitrate. This just to say that the current situation in real 
uh, operational system is, for example, that we have one-way coupling between physical and biogeochemical models, where the physics provide temperature and salinity to drive biogeochemistry. But, in my view, if we were going towards a fully coupled, two-way coupled physical biogeochemical models by means of bioptical modules, so that the biogeochemistry can provide energy as a feedback to the physical model, we can actually do two-way coupled assimilation such that we can improve quantum operandi, uh, physics and biogeochemistry and exploit all the mass of data, physical and biogeochemical, that we can collect now with integrated monitoring systems. And this is something that actually uh, we are going to explore in the Horizon 2020 European project that we won right today. And so I'm very happy that we will have the means to explore these hypotheses in practice in the real future. So some concluding remarks, because I think that I'm at the end of my time. So a biogeochemical data simulation can pro improve the prediction of biogeochemical indicators and even probably to help uh, physical data simulation in improving the simulation of physical variables. So uh, there is the uh, need to improve the models, uh, resolve biases for biogeochemical and physical models, and also uh, some um, issues with the non-Gaussianity and non-linearity uh, of biogeochemical data and methods, hypotheses need to be improved. The new data that we are assimilating in operational systems, for example, PFTs, optical data, and biogeochemical argo floats data has some uh, pros and cons. And two-way coupling of physical biogeochemical modeling and data simulation is, in my view, uh, where we should go uh, in the next uh, future. Uh, that's it. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to take them. Thank you. A uh, reminder, if you have a question, use the raise your hand feature. And we also like to see you um, on video if you feel comfortable doing so. And if you have uh, any audio problems, feel free to type in your question into the chat box. All right, do we have any questions? Um, I, I don't know how to raise my hand, uh, so I'll just uh, speak up, <laughs> Sergey. Yeah, um, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for a very good review, Stefano. I want to kind of probe your thoughts and maybe somebody else can comment on it as well. So as we're moving to this coupled, um, you know, world of coupled tree analysis, where we run coupled models of atmosphere, ocean, ice, and probably by geochemistry. Yep. Hmm. Do, you think that, do you think that biogeochemical data simulation is mature enough to be part of this, or do we still need to address some key challenges and what these key challenges would be? Oh, but that's a very good question. Um, but the key challenges uh, of biogeochemical data, sim okay, the, 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 the things are maturing. This is definitely an answer. Uh, in the sense that, for example, operational centers uh, are now routinely doing uh, assimilation of biogeochemical data and providing biogeochemical products. And big progress has been done. And now the availability of the biogeochemical argo floats probably will be a kind of revolution in this area as the argo floats uh, temperature and salinity data has been a, quite a revolution for physical data simulation. So we are doing fast progresses and yes, I think that biogeochemical data simulation now has the dignity to say to sit at the same table of physical uh, data simulation and uh, on the and on the other uh, components of the Earth system. Again, I think that it, it's quite interesting aspect that I passed through very quickly. The thing that. Uh, the, the looking at the biogeochemical variables can really help, I think, also the assimilation and the modeling of the other components of the ocean. Physics, again, we have never paid so much attention 
to the problem of spurious vertical velocities in global models that assimilate physical data. Isn't that true? And only now that we are running couple models and we can see that these spurious vertical velocities are bringing nutrients from the deep ocean into the surface. And we can see these blooms of phytoplankton that are not observed from space. Now we are paying attention to this problem of physical data assimilation. And again, uh, I showed a publication whereby assimilating nutrients, they were able to improve the simulation of the vertical profiles of temperature in a physical model. So there are synergies that we should exploit, I think. Thank you. We have a question from Shane. Go ahead. Um, hello, Stefano. Thank you very much for your presentation. So this is a topic that I really don't know much about, but uh, maybe you talked about it, but I missed it. Could you give us again an example of how coupling the biogeochemical properties help the physics? Do you use empirical relationships or do you use physical relationships? Can you go back to your example, maybe? Yeah, I will. Uh, I will share again the screen. So. Um, okay. So first I will mention you again, the issue. can you see the screen, right? Yes. Hello? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is a, a paper of Park et al. in 2018. Uh, I think it's uh, he's working at, at NOAA, um, if I'm not wrong. Okay, so here it's a little bit the issue. So here we have a, a chlorophyll data from satellite. This is a model, global model, that simulates chlorophyll. And this is, which is doing quite well, not too bad, right? The two are quite similar. This is what happened to the simulation to the simulation of chlorophyll when in the couple model you are assimilating temperature and salinity profiles. You see, you are completely messing up chlorophyll simulation, right? Why does it happen? This is the simulation of the vertical velocities by the model. And this is the vertical velocities when you assimilate the temperature and salinity uh, profiles, right? You see, these are, are quite unrealistic. So the physical model is uh, deteriorating when it assimilates physical data. While when we have this problem with chlorophyll, simply because uh, these vertical velocities are bringing to the surface nutrients unrealistically. So these nutrients are fueling the phytoplankton bloom. So where is this problem? What did this guy do, by the way, uh, to solve the problems with their couple model, which is part of a nerve system model, if I'm not wrong, they simply switched off with a linear function, the assimilation of the Argo data, temperature and salinity in the tropics. So the solution in this case was to not assimilate physical data because it was messing up the physical simulation and therefore the chlorophyll simulation. So starting from this, this paper here by you et al, they were simulating uh, temperature uh, nitrate in the canal. So uh, this is not a realistic uh, model, but um, artificial data, but help us to explain what happened. So uh, there is a clear coupling between the temperature and so the stratification and the nutrient distribution. You see night temperature and nitrogen. So if we do not do any simulation, this is the relationship between the two, the vertical, uh, the vertical uh, link between temperature and nitrate. So here we have three examples of different assimilation experiments. Here, they have assimilated only temperature, I think, to correct only the temperature profiles. 
So here they were breaking this temperature uh, and nutrient relationship when they were assimilating only the temperature data. They here are sorry, here they are using an ensemble Kahneman filter where the links between physical and biochemical variables are provided by cross correlation between the ensembles of the variables. Is it uh, clear? Okay, so you're using empirical relationships between the physical and the BCG variables. That's how you make the link for the two-way coupling. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here, I mean, there is a deterministic link between the two because, as I said, temperature and salinity and irradiance are inputs to the biogeochemical variables, right? Are forcings. So when you are running a simulation and you are perturbing uh, these variables, you create an ensemble. And there is uh, a link, cross-correlation, between the physical and biochemical variables that, yes, are empirical, but behind this relationship, there are deterministic links given by the model equations, of course. So uh, the ensemble Kalman filter exploits these correlations to correct one variable by assimilating the other variables. And okay. so, yeah. Sorry, okay, I, great. I, I talked no, no, to say to say this. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I Thank actually have much. a question. I don't know if there were other people with their hands raised, but since you are on this uh, slide, I also had a question concerning this. It was not clear to me in the last bottom right panel where you say even better whether that's already an example of a, a two-way uh, physical and biogeochemical uh, uh, data simulation where you allow the biogeochemistry to uh, feedback to the physics. So uh, if I remember well, no, in that application, there was no two-way coupling. It was still one-way coupling. So it was a, a, a one-way coupling, but still they were assimilating both the variables. Mm. So because of the ensemble Kahneman filter and these empirical relationships between the physical and biochemical variables, they were still able uh, to correct uh, with physical data, the biogeochemical, to correct the biogeochemical, and with the biogeochemical data to correct the physics. It's, it's a little bit a, a paradox, if you want, because, sorry, now I go back to this slide here. Mm -hmm. This is the current situation. So you have a one-way link between physics and biogeochemistry, with the physics that provides attraction and diffusion and temperature and salinity. So ironically, in the current situation, this is argued by Song, actually demonstrated by these guys, with variational methods, by assimilating biogeochemical data, you can constrain physical data. Mm -hmm. But by assimilating physical data, you cannot constrain biogeochemical data. To my knowledge, there is just one model at the moment that is running with a two-way coupling by Manitza, if I'm not wrong. And... And, but they are not doing that assimilation. So it's something really new. Yeah. And I think if I can uh, just say another, make another comment, I think this uh, two-way coupling is very, uh, you know, seems very promising. And I think like, for example, in uh, um, prediction experiments, it just seems like uh, um, biogeochemical variables seem to have even a higher predictability than, than physical variables. So they could inform the physics. Uh, potentially, yes, yes, quite. A, it's yeah, it's what I am arguing. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I see two more questions at least um, with participants who raise their hand, and one in the chat. Um, is it okay if we keep you a little longer, Stefano? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. Happy. Uh, so, perfect. Thank you. Um, so, Patrick, please go ahead. I see you're on. Uh, yeah, Stefano, thank you. That's a very nice talk. I, I have a question whether whether you wouldn't agree that maybe for the coupled assimilation and the, the spurious issues that you're encountering, uh, the method of assimilation becomes an important one. Uh, one example is that there's a paper by Pico et al. 
2018 or 19 in ocean modeling, where they clearly show that the, the impact of the analysis increment having a spurious uh, vertical velocity, and that's exactly the problem, very sensitive to the biology um, that will persist for at least one day uh, before it basically subsides. And, um, and related to this, there is actually an effort called the BSOCI, the Biological or Biogeochemical Southern Ocean State Estimate, that does actually, that is a coupled uh, biogeochemical and physical data assimilation model. Uh, there's a paper by Ayan Verdi, Matt Maslov, and others, which do show that I think they, they jointly assimilate both the physical data uh, and the biogeochemical data. They actually, to my knowledge, seem to be successful in actually proving each other's state. And I think one major merit here is that they are avoiding these assimilation increments and therefore these spurious um, adjustment um, processes like vertical velocities. Uh, yeah. Uh, if, um, so if I'm not wrong, in that uh, paper that you mentioned, they were as it, it was a 1D model, a Lagrangian 1D model that, no, it's a full 3D model of the Southern Ocean. Yeah, it's the... Uh, well, isn't it, I, I think as far as I know, it is the MIT GCM that's been coupled to the Bling model. The Bling ah, model okay. is basically a version of the GFDL uh, biogeochemical model that's been adapted um, and and basically coupled Bling MIT GCM model to the Southern Ocean. Ah, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I, I misunderstood that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, the thing is that this issue of the vertical velocities is more evident in the tropical uh, ocean, uh, as as well in the on the shelf sea here in the northeast Atlantic. As well, we are doing couple physical biogeochemical simulation, but not with a two way couple system, and we don't see. Uh, a big issue in assimilating physical data. The problem is exactly at the tropics. Uh, the issue is because you can... Uh, I, I'm not a physical uh, guy, so I'm not able to explain that very well, but it's less constrained uh, some kind of relationship between um, surface and um, horizontal transport and vertical dynamics are less constrained. So it's something that you see in the tropics. It's it's quite well confined. It, uh, um, it has been demonstrated that. I, I really suggest that paper of Park. And then, there are, I mean, it's true that there are techniques that now are being employed uh, to try to solve these methods, for example, to uh, a little bit, uh, how would say, spalmare, uh, to... Uh, spread. Say again? Spread. To spread, thank you. <laughs> to spread the increments uh, in time so that you solve the issue. But still, and this is a paper by Waters, if I'm not wrong. Uh, but still, the issue is not solved in the tropics again. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, yeah. hey, Anish, you have your hands raised? Yanish, are you there? Hello, there you can you hear me? Yep. Can you? Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Stefano, for a very interesting talk and great summary of all these different studies. Um, I had a related question to what um, I think Antonita and Shane mentioned, um, and also another um, a question on observations that are required. So. In terms of doing the strongly coupled data assimilation where you have the two-way coupling between the physics and um, the biology, do you think we have good background error covariances to spread the information well? And if not, do you anticipate doing uh, more Aussie-like studies to get co-located, um, to get the best positions in the ocean to get co-located biological and physical ocean variables that would be useful to inform on their error covariance estimation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my approach, uh, and I think the approach of most uh, of the people now, 
uh, also with variational methods with this problem of the background would be more uh, more dramatic is to uh, run ensemble or hybrid variational ensemble methods so that you can infer some uh, of the background uh, in a dynamical way uh, from the ensemble. So this is what, for example, I have planned in a, in a project uh, that we have just put in to write, to run some high or and some pure ensemble methods or hybrid variational ensemble methods. So for the, I guess for, at least for the hybrid ensemble, you need a static part and the dynamic ensemble part. And for the static part, it could be useful to get um, yeah, more observations and more information on how variables are co correlated or covariating across the physics and biology, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and trying to find that part, hey, it's uh, of course challenging, and still, uh, 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 it's something to to test and to do. Yeah. And would you have recommendations, like for instance, for our panel to engage on in terms of promoting more co-located observations of physics and biology, like Argo BGC is one um, option, like are there regions in the world, like you mentioned, the tropics are the most challenging um, for the vertical velocity. So similar to that, are there regions in the world where we should increase co-located observations of physics and biology? Yeah, as you said, as at, at the tropics, uh, for sure, would be extremely useful because uh, right there uh, you can, for example, <laughs> exploit uh, the one to improve or to improve or to keep an eye on the other. Uh, on other areas, it's true; it's less uh, uh, it's less impellent. Uh, uh, for example, in the as I said, in the shelf, we had run some examples, and we could see that we could quite easily and steadily find some relationship between uh, between the two uh, type of information. I can say and confirming what you said in the tropics, probably it's the most uh, uh, significant place where we should run these concurrent uh, measurements. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And we have a question in the chat from Allison Gray. She says, thanks for the great presentation. In addition to CHL data, BGC Argo floats can measure nitrate, oxygen, pH, backscatter, and irradiance. From a DA perspective, are some of these more valuable than others? Mm, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, me personally, at the moment, um, I'm uh, assimilating glider data that has this range of simulations of uh, of variables. At the moment, uh, I'm in practice. I'm uh, I'm talking as a person with a hands on. So the oxygen simulate the oxygen assimilation was the less uh, useful, if you want, to improve the other state variables. Uh, in our uh, biogeochemical models, because it was quite weak, the link between oxygen as simulated variable, I'm talking about the model, not the real system, and the other variables, was very useful uh, to assimilate, uh, of course, um, fluorescence as an indicator of chlorophyll. pH, assimilation of pH uh, and backscatter irradiance it's something that I'm going to do very soon, but I have no direct experience at the moment, I'm afraid. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions or any that I've missed? All right. I don't see any new hands up. Uh, so I think we can end it there. It's uh, 1240 on my side. So thank you, Stefano, for your presentation. Um, I will share a recording of this later this week. Um, and reminder to all of the people on the pause panels and anyone else that you think might be interested in these talks. Um, we do have two more webinars this week. So one tomorrow at the same time. This is from Greg Foltz. He's going to be presenting on the Tropical Atlantic Observing System. And then one on Thursday, let me pull that up. Um, that is by Patrick Heimbach and his talk title is Learning from Sparse Observations, the Ocean Parameter and State Estimation Problem. 
So hopefully I will see you guys tomorrow at the same time. And thank you, Stefano, again for presenting. Thank you very much to you. If you have any question that I didn't manage to answer, please write me. I would be very happy to continue this conversation in the next days. And it was a big pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much.